people that the Most High has favored above all the people of the earth. The Bible has showed us that. Let's just review what we've already seen. Because, you know, let me tell you something. This earth, in terms of, in terms of spiritual belief, is so backwards. I mean, it is so messed up. It has become so pagan that when you preach or teach the truth of what the Bible actually says on most subjects, people will think you are crazy. That's what happens. Because, the, because it's so backwards. <laughs> it has become so brainwashed that when you read the scriptures for yourself and you see things in there, it says certain things. That when you, if you were to repeat it to somebody that doesn't read the scriptures, they would say, you're crazy. But nevertheless, it doesn't take away from the truth of what the word of the Most High says. And so let's look, just as a quick review, these be the words, Deuteronomy, Adabarim, chapter 7, chapter 7. Notice what it says, these be the words, Deuteronomy, chapter 7. It's true. Chapter 7, I'm going to read from verse 6 and down to verse 8. Actually, yes, from verse 6 to 8. Yes, it says things that if you actually tell people this is what the scriptures say, they will say you are crazy. And be honest with you. Be honest with ourselves, right? I mean, there are things we have found in the scriptures that we thought, wow, is that really in there? Right? I mean, really, isn't that true? Haven't we found things in the scripture and we said, wait a minute, is that really in there? Is it really saying that? So we have to admit ourselves, you know, when we study the scriptures, it surprises us. But we have we have decided that these scriptures are holy to the most high. This is his representation of his word. And so as crazy as it may sound to our, our pagan ears or our brainwashed heads, we, we follow it to be true. And so here we go. Look at this. He's talking about his chosen people, Israel. For thou art an holy people unto Yahweh thy Aliyim. Yahweh thy Aliyim have chosen thee to be a special people himself above all people that are upon the face of the earth. Yahweh did not set his love upon you nor choose you because ye were more in number than any people, for ye were the fewest of all people. But because Yahweh loved you, and because ye would keep the oath which he had sworn unto your fathers, hath Yahweh brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you out of the house of bondmen from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. So he said, he has chosen the children of Jacob as a special people unto himself. And notice what he said, above all people that are upon the face of the earth. Did I make that up? Or is it right there in black and white? Isn't it right there? Didn't he say it? Okay, now look. Somebody might ask, if he said that, why is he allowing his people to be trampled upon, stepped on, shot in the street, thrown in jail, and, and mercilessly treated for all of these centuries? Why is he allowing that if these are the people he's chosen above all people? This is very easy to answer. It's not a hard question to answer. Let me explain it to you this way in a way that you all can understand. When you really love somebody, right? I mean, first of all, have you, if you've ever, and not everybody has, so I can't assume, but if you've ever been in love with somebody, it's kind of scary. Why? Why is it scary? Because what you're doing is you're leaving yourself exposed, right? Right? You're leaving your heart in an exposed manner so that if you give yourself to somebody and they turn around and hurt you, boy, they really hurt you because you gave yourself, like you opened yourself up to them. You just left it there and you put it all out there because you love them. You understand what I'm saying? So if they turn around and step all over your heart, if they turn around and mess you up, now you become what? You become hurt, but then you become very angry. Is that true or not? It becomes very angry. <laughs> you turn around, they, they, you've given your heart to them. You just opened yourself up and you, you've taken a chance. And you were scared. You were scared because you knew it was a possibility. So you, you, but you gave yourself over for whatever reason. 
and they turned around and stepped all over your heart, and now you're angry. You're angry at them. You're very angry. Some people get so angry that they hurt the, the other person. They're just mad now. They just, they're angry, right? And see, the Most High opened his self up to the children of Israel. He gave himself over to them. He didn't leave anything behind. Like he just gave himself completely over to, to, be, to be their aliyim. And they turned around and served other gods. They turned around and served other gods. So now he was angry. Huh? He was angry. The Bible calls it his hot displeasure. And so because of that, he said, okay, you going to treat me like this after everything I did for you? Let me show you what I'm going to do now. And what he did is he allowed Satan to run roughshod over his people for many centuries until they realized what they did in messing with the Most High's heart like that because he's jealous. See? And so when they realized what they did, and even, even in his anger and in his fury, in the midst of all of that, what he did, he sent his only begotten son as a way to try to redeem them who had been sold over into sin. He went and he sent his son to buy them back from sin. And he set up a way so that they can come back to him and he can be reconciled to them. And he, being that he is the most high and he knows the, the end from the beginning, he knew that there would be a remnant of them that would come back to him and be faithful. He knew that. And so he's willing, he was willing to put his own son out there. His son was willing to be sacrificed. Then he set up his son and the high priestly ministry so that also that we can be back with him again. We can be fully reconciled, be fully perfected. He set it all up. So that's why he said, I have chosen you, <laughs> Israel, above all the people upon the face of the earth. And I chose you because I have a promise to your fathers and I'm going to keep my promise to your father. So now we see that he definitely has a chosen people, right? I mean, it was right there in the scriptures. He has a chosen people that are his people. We can definitely see that. Okay. Now, in these be the words, Deuteronomy chapter 11, we're going to see not only does he have a chosen people. But he's got a chosen land on the earth. I mean, he's got a place that he has chosen for himself on the earth. Now, before we continue, I want to just stress this point. If he has a chosen people, huh, and the devil puts his hands, his filthy, deceiving hands, on the chosen of the most high, and and, and the chosen repent of their sin. What will happen to those people who put their filthy hands on the chosen people of the Most High? What will the Most High do to those people who mishandled his chosen people? Yes, there's going to be a problem. Just like Pharaoh had a problem. Didn't Pharaoh have a problem? Pharaoh had a serious problem. He had been putting his hands on the most high people, throwing them in the river to be eaten by crocodiles and alligators, right? And whipping them and making them slaves. He had, he had put his hands on the wrong folks. So when they repented and came back to the most high and it was time for deliverance, Boy, boy, Egypt had a serious problem. They had a serious problem. Okay? And this is this this is now a worldwide situation. See, that was just one nation under the planet Earth. You got 150 or something nations right now on the planet Earth. And the most highest chosen are scattered throughout all of these nations. And people have been putting their hands on them and mistreating them and scheming against them and and you know basically exploiting them and exploiting their land and trying to destroy them. And so when the awakening is fully underway, which is started, and the Most High's chosen people start to awaken, the people that have misused them and abused them and exploited them are going to have a bigger problem than Pharaoh had. And a matter of fact, Messiah said it would have been better if they had not been born. 
it's coming that way. So here we're going to see in chapter 11 of these be the words, Adabarim. We're going to see that not only does he have a chosen people, he's got a chosen land. And let me go further. If he's got a chosen land, if what we're going to read in Deuteronomy is true, and he's got a chosen land, and some heathen are occupying that land, and they're putting their heathen practices on that land, and they're identity thieving, and they're bombing, and they're doing all kind of rape and pillaging, and they don't have any business there. What do you think are going to happen to those people? Just the same thing as what happened to the Canaanites when the children of Israel come out of Egypt and went through the desert and they come out a million strong and they come into the borders of Kadesh Barnea and the children of Jericho saw them, there's going to be a problem. And there was a problem. And so now he's got his eyes on a particular land. We're going to see this. We're going to talk about it. It's all in these be the words, chapter 11, Deuteronomy chapter 11. Let's look at this. Deuteronomy chapter 11. Let us begin at verse 1. Deuteronomy chapter 11, beginning at verse 1 and go down to verse 5. Thank you, Sister Josie. The Bible says, therefore, thou shalt love Yahweh thy Aliyim. And keep his charge and his statutes and his judgments and his commandments alway. And know ye this day, for I speak not with your children, which have not known, which have not seen the chastisement of Yahweh, your Aliyim, his greatness, his mighty hand, and his stretched arm, and his miracles, and his acts which he did in the midst of Egypt unto Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and unto all his land. And what he did unto the army of Egypt, unto their horses, and to their chariots, how he made the water of the Red Sea to overflow them as they pursued after you, and how Yahweh hath destroyed them unto this day, and what he did unto you in the wilderness until ye came unto this place. Huh? He brought all that up. Wait a minute. I'm going to read two more. Down to verse 7. Down to verse 7. And what he did unto Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, the son of Reuben, and how the earth opened her mouth and swallowed them up and their household and their tents and all the substance that was in their possession in the midst of all Israel. But your eyes have seen all the great acts of Yahweh, which he did. Amen. Now, brothers and sisters, let me tell you something. You and I, you and I live in the year 2016. A.D. We weren't there physically when these things took place. Right? But what is the Most High saying to those people that were there? What is he saying to them when he reminds them of all these things? He's trying to remind them of what, from whence he brought them. Where did he bring you from? Where did he cut? Where did he take you from? What miracles did he perform to get you out of where you came from? What did he do? Who did he have to overthrow to free you from where you were? Hmm? And to get you where you are today. That's what he's basically saying. Brothers and sisters, we don't have anything to fear. It has been said we have nothing to fear of the future except we forget where the Most High has led us in the, from the past and his teachings that he taught us. Huh? Don't forget where he led you from. Don't forget from what he delivered you. Don't forget where you were before you met him and where you are now. Right? So he said, that's why he said, love him, keep his charge, his statutes and his judgments and his commandments always. Because you know what he did for you. Let me tell you something. There will not be any individual on the sea of glass that does not have a testimony. Every individual who has been redeemed by the Most High has a testimony. Okay? Okay? Every individual has a testimony of how they were freed from sin. 
Every individual has a testimony of how the Most High forgave them. Every individual has a testimony of meeting the Messiah for themselves and of how the promises of his word became real to them. There will be no persons on the sea of glass without a testimony. So let us not forget from whence he took us, how we got to where we are now, and let us not forget where we're going. Huh? Where we're going. So he said, remember all of these things? You've been chastised. You've been delivered. You've seen how I treated people that rebelled against me in the midst of the Israelites. You've seen all these things. Remember who you're serving. This is the most high. This is not the gods of Egypt. <laughs> this is not the gods of the Sunday keeping peoples or the Baptists and the Mormons. This is not the gods of the institutionalized people of the SDA. This is not the gods of the Jehovah Witnesses or the Catholics. This is not the gods of the Muslims. This is the most high. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The covenant keeping most high. Who has a son. The Messiah. That's who we serve. Amen. That's who we serve. These be the words. Deuteronomy. Chapter 11. These be the words. From verse 7. From verse 7. Watch this. From verse 7 down to verse 9. We're going to break this into a couple pieces. But your eyes have seen all the great acts of Yahweh, which he did. Therefore shall ye keep all the commandments which I command you this day, that ye may be strong and go in and possess the land, whether ye go to possess it, and that ye may prolong your days in the land which Yahweh swear unto your fathers to give unto them and to their seed, a land that floweth with milk and honey. Let me stop right here. Let me stop right here. Verse nine for a minute. Where we see right here, we see a promise. Do you see the promise? And from verses seven to nine, there's a promise, a very powerful promise. Do you see the promise? There's a promise there. Do you see the promise? The promise that he gave. I'm going to tell you what verse it is. It's in verse, the promise is in verse 8 and 9. What's the promise? Give me the promise. No, no. Tell me the promise. Verse, yes, there's a land they're going to get. There's a land. What else? What else? Tell me it's in verse 8 and verse 9. Yes, yes, yes. He said, I he said, if you keep my commandments, look, he said, that you may be strong. Wait. He said, if you obey his commandments, you going to be what? He said that ye may be strong. Woo! Strong is the opposite of weak. <laughs> Amen? That ye may be strong. Didn't he say that? If you keep my commandments, you going to be strong. What do you mean strong? In what way? In every way. Starting with faith. Starting with that, Messiah taught us if we got faith, we can move mountains. He's saying here, if you obey my commandments, you're going to be strong. Amen. You're not going to be weak. You're going to be strong. Brothers and sisters, he said, nothing will overtake you if you keep my commandments. Nothing will overcome you. He's going to say more than that as we continue reading. He's going to say more than that. But he's telling you, he, you're going to be strong. That's right. That's right. So if you are going to be strong, we know if you're going to keep his commandments, that means you're going to be receiving the power of justification, being freed or cleared of all your guilt. Because why? Not because you're a good person, not because you deserve it, not because you perform some phenomenal act. No, you're going to be receiving justification by faith, the clearing of all your guilt because of the righteousness and sacrifice of the Messiah. And then he's going to give you a coat to wear. Better than Joseph's coat that Jacob made for him. Better than Joseph's coat of many colors. He's going to give you a coat 
of perfect righteousness to put on. And with that coat of perfect righteousness that you that you wear by faith, and with that justification, which means all your sin is forgiven. You have no more sin. Now you can be keeping his commandments. And he just said, if you keep my commandments, you're going to be strong. <laughs> Amen. You're going to be strong. You're not going to be a weak people. You're going to be strong. Remember that? That's a pr Brothers and sisters, the Bible does tell us that we are changed into the divine nature. How? By trusting in the promises of the Most High. Hmm? It says you are changed into the divine nature. You become partakers of a divine nature. It, uh, because why? Because of the promises, the great and precious promises of the Most High. And here's one of them right here. If you keep my commandments, you're going to be strong. And you're going to go in and possess the land. For us, that means heavenly Canaan. Amen? It means what? Heavenly Canaan. It is a beautiful land. And we are well able to possess it. <laughs> Amen? It is a beautiful land. And we are well able to possess it. Amen? <laughs> That's right, the new Jerusalem is heavenly Canaan. If we obey his commandments through the justifying power of the blood of the Messiah and the perfect righteousness that he offers us, we can be strong and obey all his commandments and statutes and judgments, and we can possess the land. We are well able to take it. He's going to fight for us. He said he was going to fight for us, and he's well able to take it. Praise the most high. That's a whole different thing than some of these folks out here saying, I hope I'm saved. I, 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 I hope I'm saved. Are you saying, I don't know. I hope I am. I don't know. That's different, isn't it? That's different, right? <laughs> Praise the most high. His promises are sure. Hmm? Somebody say, well, what if I slip? What if I, what if I slip and sin? The Bible says, these things have I written unto, written unto you that ye sin not. But if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Yahweh Shai Amashiach, the righteous, who is the propitiation or mercy seat for our sins. And not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. So if you fall, don't worry about it. Come back in repentance. He's ready to give you back. The code of righteousness. Praise the Most High. Praise the Most High. See, that's the whole thing. He's doing the work. All we got to do is have is the work of faith, the work of believing, trusting. That's the work we have to do. See, the work of receiving by faith the Spirit. He does the rest of that stuff. All that polishing. You see, he's the what's to say? He is the uh, author and the finisher of our faith that what the scripture say in hebrews chapter 12 he's the author and the finisher the finisher the, uh, is like the finisher of a of a of a polishing of a piece of furniture he's putting a perfect finish to the furniture right he does that we don't do that see that's the problem with a lot of brothers out here i was talking to somebody on youtube the other day he just didn't get it and i told him i said i'm gonna have to pray for you he was a son of your fed he just wasn't getting it and i said you know i'm gonna pray for you you son of your fed you haven't gotten it you're trying to get rights in this by works he said we need strict discipline he said we need military style discipline he's talking about he's talking about serving the most high i said man you ain't catching the spirit of righteousness at all it ain't about robotically serving the Most High like you in some sort of trance. That ain't it. Righteousness is a spirit. And people that serve him, serve him as a result of receiving that spirit and that power. And it's out of gratitude of what he's done for you. See? Ain't no robotic worship. I said, you ain't catching it at all. I said, I know you ain't going to get it even though I'm explaining it now. But I'm going to pray for you. That's what I told him. I said, I'm going to pray for you. Because you ain't catching it at all, brother. He said, ye sons of your fat take too much upon you. You know, this whole righteousness by works thing. He said, faith without works is dead. See, he ain't getting it at all, man. He just ain't catching it. 
when you have the true faith of Yahweh Shai, when you have that spirit of righteousness that you have received by faith, you cannot help but perform the works that that spirit tells you to do. See, every act that you perform, testing one, two, three, I'll make sure you're here, because I want to make sure you get this. This goes back to carnal mind versus spiritual mind, okay? Every act that you perform as a human being is performed as a result of some spirit that's within you. Are you following me? Okay, it's like what the scriptures say out of the out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. So your the words that come out of your mouth come from what's balled up in your heart. Okay, it's the same with acts that you perform. The acts that you perform are as a result of whatever spirit you're receiving. So when you receive the spirit of righteousness from the Most High by faith, you can't help but perform the works of the Most High. You see what I'm saying? So that's why he said faith without works is dead because what he's really talking about is receiving the true faith. If you receive the false faith, you know, if you receive in some other gospel that has nothing to do with the perfection of righteousness that we actually need in order to be saved, if you're receiving something else, then you're not going to perform the proper works. You're going to be trying real hard, but it's going to be frustrating. And that's what a lot of people do. They try real hard instead of focusing on the spirit and on repentance and letting the growth of the fruit come naturally. That's going to happen. A tree doesn't have to try. An apple tree don't have to try to grow apples. All it has to do is get water and sunshine and nourishment from the earth, and them apples are going to come. They're going to come popping out on them branches. He said, without me, ye can do nothing. So as we connect with the, with the Messiah, and, through, and really we connect him with the Father through the Messiah, and we receive an by faith in prayer, we're receiving that spirit of righteousness and we're walking in that spirit day by day. Brothers and sisters, the fruit's going to come. It can do no other. It has to. It has to. It's when we let go of faith and we let go of the perfection that he offers us and we let go of the justifying power of the blood of Christ. When we let go and the devil does tempt us to let go, he does. He calls us to not trust in that blood. He calls us to not trust in that righteousness. He calls us to not confess our sin. He calls us to do it through pride, through discouragement. He, he does it. You know, we all know what I'm telling is true because he'll work on your heart with depression and discouragement. And then, and then on the other side, he give you that pride you think you don't need. You know, I heard one fool, and I call him a fool. He called himself a Christian, but he was really a fool. He said, uh, I, I'm way past that saved by grace. I don't need grace anymore. That boy was a fool. A fool. Yeah. So listen here. Grace, the whole thing is grace. He's giving you the righteousness as a gift. That's called grace. Right? He don't have to give you perfect righteousness as a gift. He can let you wallow in your sin. But he loved you so much. Yahweh loved you so much that he made the whole plan so that you can be redeemed from sin. And he said, sin shall not have dominion over you. Not if you want his, sin shall not have dominion over you. It shall not. Oh, it can tempt you. It's going to tempt you. There's no sin to be tempted. People are tempted all the time. The Messiah was tempted. There's no sin to be tempted. So he said, oh, you were tempted. You were te yeah, you were tempted. So what? That's not sin. But you overcome all because of the righteousness of the Messiah. Because of his righteousness. Praise the Most High. That's why, that's why the psalmist said, I will praise thy righteousness, even thine only. <laughs> I will praise thee for thy righteousness, even thine only. Deliver me in thy righteousness. That's what he said. So he said, keep my, and you go, basically, I'm telling you, 
Deuteronomy chapter 11, there's some more promises. <laughs> You're going to see some more promises. That's just the tip of the iceberg. So he said, keep my commandments, which I command you, that ye may be strong and go in and possess the land, whether ye go to possession, that ye may prolong your days on the land, which Yahweh swear to your fathers to give them and to their seed, a land flowing with milk and honey. Huh? So he says, you're going to be strong, you're going to possess the land, you're going to prolong your days on the land. And for us, that land is the heavenly Canaan, the earth and the new earth, the earth made new. And he said, if we trust the most high, if you trust his words, we are well able to take it. Isn't that what Caleb said? Isn't that what just Caleb said? He said, no, the, the, their defenses are departed from them. We, we are well able to take the land. That's what he said. We are well able to take it. <laughs> but they were going to stone that brother for saying that. He said, let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. <laughs> Amen. Even so, come quickly. That's what we say. That's what the scriptures say. Even so, come quickly. Okay. These be the words. Adabarim, chapter 11. Okay, chapter 11. So we done seen a promise. He said, you're going to be strong. You're going to go in and possess the land. You're going to prolong your days. Right? Okay? Now look at this. From verse 10, from verse 10 down to verse 12. Watch this. From verse 10 down to verse 12. Watch this, brothers and sisters. For the land, whither thou goest in to possess it, it is not as the land of Egypt from whence ye came out, where thou sowest thy seed and watered it with thy foot, as a garden of herbs. But the land where the ye go to possess is a land of hills and valleys and drinketh water of the rain of heaven. A land which Yahweh thy Aliyim careth for. The eyes of Yahweh thy Aliyim are always upon it. From the beginning of the year even unto the end of the year. Now I want to make sure you hear this here. Look at this brothers and sisters. The children of Israel were not yet in the land. Did you see that, right? He's telling them they're going to possess this land. See, this book, Adabarim, these be the words, was written right before Moses died. And they, in fact, the end of this book, Moses dies. And they go in, and the next book is Joshua. They go in to get the land. So he's telling them about this land that they have not been in yet. And what is he saying about it? He says, his eye is always upon it, all the time. So even before they got there, his eyes were on that land. That means that there's something special about that land. Are you following me? Testing one, two, three. There's something special about that land because before they even got there, his eye was already upon it. That's right. Now, we can, we can, if you look through the scriptures, you will see that definitely there's a specific spot I'm going to ask you now, where is the spot? Because And don't say Jerusalem. It's a specific spot that the Most High chose. And it says in the scriptures in three different places. Yes, I believe it is Eden, but there's a, that's right, Sister Elaine, but there's another name. Okay, I, I'm going to give you another hint, but you should get it with this hint. It's not the Mount of Olives. It's near the Mount of Olives, but I'm going to give you this hint. It's the spot where he told Abraham to offer his son Isaac. It's a specific spot. He told Abraham to offer his son Isaac on this spot. Okay? Specific. And he told he told David, that's right, that's where they set up the altar, but it's a specific spot. And he told David, uh, 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 one of the Jebusites owned it, and, and when David numbered the people, he told, it was the same spot. He told David, I want you to buy Now stop the the petty told Solomon this spot is where you're gonna build the temple. No, the burning bush was in Mount Sinai. It's a Sinai Peninsula. That's a different spot. This is a different spot. I'm gonna tell you. I'm gonna tell you. I'm gonna tell you. You know what it's called? You know what it's called? Mount Mount Moriah. Have you ever heard of Mount Moriah? Mount Moriah. Mount Moriah. That's the spot. Right? That's the spot. Yeah? That's the spot. That's the spot where all of those things I just said happened. It was on Mount Moriah. 
that he told Abraham, go offer your son at this particular spot. It was on Mount Moriah that David was told, buy this piece of land from your Jebusite and, and the pestilence will stop and offer right here, the burnt offering. And he did. Okay. And then it was on that spot that David saved up all that money and left it to Solomon to build the temple on that spot. It's just, it's just adjacent to Jerusalem. It's adjacent, it's just adjacent to Jerusalem. Okay. It's adjacent to Jerusalem. All right. So what I'm saying to you is that's the spot that's special to the most high. That's the spot right now that Muslims are occupying. There's a temple, there's a there's a Muslim mosque there. You can tell what's gonna happen to that. And that's the spot that them so-called European Jews are fighting over. Right there. Okay? And his eye is always upon it. So let me, let me, let's just break this down now. The Canaanites were on that spot. And you see what they possess this land. And the Canaanites, this spot. Occupies the tri is where look at this is where the tribe of Judah is. That's where this spot is. That's that's the land of the tribe of Judah. And wait a minute, who's from the tribe of Judah? And who's on the land now? And what's gonna happen to them? Yeah, you can know what's coming. Okay, you can know what's coming. Okay, it's not it doesn't take us a prophet to know what's getting ready to happen. Okay, so. That spot, he says, is a land that he that he looks at all the time. And so I believe it was the original spot of Eden because there's no other place that is as special as Eden. And why would I say that? Why was there no other place on the planet of the whole earth as special as the Garden of Eden? Can you tell me? Tell me why was the Garden of Eden the most special spot on the entire planet? Why? Why was that garden so special that Adam and Eve had to be forced out of it when they sinned? What was so special about that spot? Can you tell me? What was so special about that? That's exactly right. Thank you, Sister Josie, because the tree of life stood there. He had planted the tree of life there. The tree of life was the tree that Adam and Eve had to continually eat of to maintain eternal existence. The more they ate of that tree, they would maintain their eternal existence, which is why the Most High said in Genesis chapter 3, verse 22 and 24, he said uh, the man can't eat of this tree because if he eats of this tree, he's going to live forever and he's in sin. So we can't let sin live forever. So he put cherubim in front of the tree to block the man from getting there. And then he drove, the Bible said he had to drive the man out of the garden because he wasn't going to allow him to eat of that tree. Obviously, before the flood, he took that whole garden away because the garden wasn't going to be destroyed with the flood. The tree of life can't be destroyed. But that was the spot. That's right. So now the tree of life, the Bible tells us in the New Jerusalem is going to be back in the midst of the New Jerusalem. And it tells us again in Zechariah that it's in the area of the Mount of Olives. That's the same area. And the Messiah is going to come and spread that spot out right there for the new Jerusalem to sit on. And he's going to have the tree of life there. Okay? It's the same spot. And that's why his eyes are always upon it. And that's where his people are going to be. Okay? It's the same spot. Okay? So he, he has a special place. Now, we know that the heavenly Canaan, that, that, that heaven is a special place. There's no question, obviously. But it's something to know that on this earth, the most high's eyes are on a particular spot. They're on a particular spot. That's right. So Satan would love to have him or any one of his people that are in sin take one bite of the fruit of the tree of life. He would love that. And, and in their desperation... That's what they're going to try to do. In their rebellion against the covenant of the Most High and against the Most High's character, they're going to try to take the city and get one bite of that tree. Of course, they're going to fail. They're, they're not even going to come close. They're not even going to come close. They're going to be mercilessly and miserably destroyed. Okay? And and But, but we're not thinking about them. See, this is the thing, brothers and sisters. We, remember this, okay? I'm going to give you a little story. Can you hear me testing one, two, three? I'm going to tell you a quick story, all right, to help illustrate this point, okay, just to help illustrate this point. Back in the 1980s, 
there's a sport called basketball. And in basketball, there's professional teams that play basketball for money. It's called the National Basketball Association. And in the 1980s, there was a team in Los Angeles. And during the 1980s, this team was so good, okay, that out of the 10 years that made up the decade, they won the championship five times, okay? They were really, really good at playing basketball, the Los Angeles team. No, it wasn't Michael Jordan's team, actually, but this was the Los Angeles team. So one day, somebody interviewed one of the players on the Los Angeles team. Now, follow me. They interviewed him, and they said, how do you prepare? How does your team prepare against your opponents? Okay? How does your team prepare against your opponents? And the player said this. He said, we don't worry about our opponents. He said, when we're out there, we know what we're doing. And it's just us and the basketball. Like, it doesn't even matter who's there. It's just us and the basketball. I mean, that's how good they were. They weren't even concerned with who the opponent was. They knew that they had to, they knew what they needed to do. And he was saying, if we do what we know how to do, it's just us and the basketball. It doesn't matter who the opponent is. Well, why did I bring that up? Because the Most High is telling us it's just us and him. We know what we need to do. You understand what I'm saying? We know what we need to do. He's telling us we need to receive the cleansing power of the justifying power of the blood of the Messiah. We need to receive by faith the gift of perfect righteousness that he's offering us. We need to receive that spirit, and then through that, we are obedient to all his commandments, his statutes, and his judgments. That's between us and him. It doesn't matter what our opponents are doing. It doesn't matter what our enemies are doing. It doesn't matter what their plans are. It doesn't matter what they want. It doesn't matter as long as we are doing what we're supposed to do. You got me? Testing one, two, three. It doesn't matter. It's just us and the Most High and His Word. As long as we are focused on that, it doesn't matter what they're doing. Right? It doesn't matter. They can make any plans they want. They can make any Sunday law plans. They can make any, any United Nations plans, any Mark of the Beast plans. It doesn't matter. As long as we understand it's us and the commandments of the Most High and His Word. It's like Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Nebuchadnezzar made a statue, and he wanted everybody to worship the statue. But to the three Hebrews, that didn't matter. The statue didn't matter. And that's why they, he, he brought them up and in front of everybody, he threatened them. And, they, and he, like, it's like he was saying, you know, you guys need to think about what you're getting ready to say. And he said, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. In other words, we don't have to think about it. It doesn't matter. He said, if it be so, our Aliyim, who we serve, he can deliver us and he will deliver us out your hand. But if he chooses not to, we'll just burn. It doesn't matter. Because it was between them and the Most High. You understand what I'm saying? So we don't have to keep our eyes on anyone else or anything else. His word, the Messiah, and the Father. And we receive in that line the Spirit. Doesn't matter what they're doing. Doesn't matter what their plans are. But... The Most High has shown us. He has laid open all the plans of the devil before us. It's called the book of Revelation. He has laid open all his plans. He has shown us everything he's getting ready to do. So we can see we're not surprised by anything. And that's why the Messiah said, I told you these things before. He doesn't see it's going to be a surprise to the people of planet Earth when the Messiah arrives. But it is not going to be a surprise to his chosen people. Not, they're not surprised. They're going to be rejoicing because they're expecting him to come back. You understand? They're going to be rejoicing because their expectation is being fulfilled. But it's going to be a surprise to the rest of the planet. Just like when Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed. Let me ask you a question. When Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed, was Abraham surprised? Was Abraham surprised? When Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed, was Abraham surprised and amazed that they were destroyed? No. He understood they were going to be destroyed. That wasn't even a question. Because he was connected with the Most High. 
But were the inhabitants of Sodom surprised? Were the inhabitants of Sodom and Gomorrah surprised at what happened to them? Yes, they were surprised. Unpleasantly surprised. It's the same thing. The people of the Most High are not going to be surprised at the return of the Messiah because they're expecting it. The people that are not his people are going to be thoroughly, unexpectedly, and unpleasantly surprised. So what they're doing, it doesn't matter. Our game is about keeping connection with the Father, his Son, and the Word. That's right. So let's continue. Let's look at some more promises. See, see what he said here? So he said, his eye, let me just read that one more time because it's, it's, like I said, there are things that the scriptures say that are so unbelievable that if people don't, that don't read the scriptures will say to you, you're crazy <laughs> because they don't read the scriptures and they say some unbelievable things. Notice again, these be the words, Deuteronomy chapter 10 from, I mean, chapter 11, excuse me, from verse 10 down to verse 12. Notice what it says. Deuteronomy chapter 11 from verse 10 down to verse 12. But the land, I'm sorry, for the land whither thou goest in to possess it is not as the land of Egypt from whence he came out, where thou sowest thy seed and waterest it with thy foot as a garden of herbs. But the land whither ye go to possess it is a land of hills and valleys and drinketh water of the rain of heaven a land which Yahweh thy Aliyim careth for. The eyes of Yahweh thy Aliyim are always upon it. From the beginning of the year, even until the end of the year. See, see, he said his eyes are always on that land. Always upon it. Right now, the Most High is preparing his 144,000. That's what he's doing. He's preparing his 144,000. Because his eyes on that land. And they're they going crazy over there. But he's not doing anything right now. Except preparing his 144,000. All his time is being used in preparation of the 144,000. When they are ready, you're going to see some things. You're going to see some tremendous things. Once the seal of the 144,000 is prepared. These be the words. Adabarim, Deuteronomy chapter 11. From verse 13 down to verse 17. Notice the scripture from verse 13 down to verse 17. These be the words. Adabarim chapter 11 from verse 13 down to verse 17. And it shall come to pass if ye shall hearken diligently unto my commandments, which I command you this day, to love Yahweh your Aliyim, and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul. That I will give you, here's another promise, that I will give you the rain in your land in his due season, the first rain and the latter rain, that thou mayest gather thy corn and thy wine and thine oil, and I will send grass in thy fields for thy cattle, that thou mayest eat and be full. Take heed to yourselves that your heart be not deceived, and ye turn aside and serve other gods, and worship them. And, and then Yahweh's wrath be kindled against you, and he shut up the heaven that there be no rain, and that the land yield not her fruit, lest ye perish quickly from off the good land which Yahweh giveth you. Wait a minute, brothers and sisters, you know we got to go through this. Oh, wait, wait a minute. So he, here's another promise. Here's another promise. He's saying if they obey his commandments, Specifically, they do not worship other gods. That he will bless them. That he will give them the early rain. And what else? The latter rain. Now talk to me, brothers and sisters. What does that mean for us in 2016? Obviously, we're not on the land yet. He's promising us he's going to bless us on the land. But what, what does it mean to us in 2016 when he talks about the, the early rain and the latter rain that he promises to them that obey him? What is he talking about, brothers and sisters, when he says this? What is he dealing with? Talk to me. What is he dealing with? Come on, y'all know. Talk to me. No, 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 no. Come on, come on, come on. All right, all right. Do I have to do I have to show you the scriptures? Let me show you the scriptures. Let me show you the scriptures. Ready? You ready for the scriptures? Here you go. Here you go. 
All right? Joel. Huh? Yahal. Yahal, otherwise known as Joel. Huh? Joel, chapter 2. Joel, chapter 2. Huh? Yahal, chapter 2. Joel, chapter 2. I'm going to read from verse 23 down to verse 29. Joel chapter 2 from verse 23 down to verse 29. Tell me what we're talking about here, okay? Look at it now. Watch it closely. Ready? Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in Yahweh your Aliyim, for he hath given you the former rain moderately. And we and will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. And the floors shall be full of wheat, and the fats shall overflow with wine and oil. And I will restore unto you the years which the locusts had eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you. And ye shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of Yahweh, your Aliyim, that hath dealt wondrously with you. My people shall never be ashamed. And ye shall know that I am in the midst of Israel and that I am your Ali, your I am Yahweh, excuse me, your Aliyim, and none else. And my people shall never be ashamed. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your old men shall dream dreams. And your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. What are we talking about? When we talk about this early rain and this latter rain in 2016, what are we talking about? What are we getting, brothers and sisters? What is he promising to those that are obedient to him? The Holy Ghost, that's exactly right. He's promising the Spirit to us. That's right. He's promising the Spirit to us. And those that don't receive the Spirit are going to have, are going to have famine. Famine, right? And those that worship other gods will not receive the spirit. Are you following me? Those that worship other gods will not receive the spirit. So it's going to be, again, two classes of people. Okay? Two classes of people. They're going to have a class of people that receive the latter reign of the power of the spirit. That's right. Out of the belly shall flow rivers of living water. Amen? And those are the true worshipers of the Most High. Those people that receive the latter rain are going to be proven by the fact that they receive of that spirit, that they are the true worshipers of the Most High. They're going to be a class of people that do not receive it. And it's going to be shown they have not been worshiping the Most High. They were worshiping some other God and thinking it was the Most High. That is why Matthew 7 says, many will say unto the Messiah in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not done this and that in your name? And he says to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. I never knew you. In other words, you never were worshiping me. You might have thought you were, but you weren't worshiping me because I wasn't there. Huh? So, brothers and sisters, it goes again to show there's a large class of people on planet Earth that are thinking they're worshiping the same Most High we're talking about here, and they're not. They're not. They're not worshiping the same Most High that we're talking about. They're not even worshiping the same Messiah that we're talking about. Because they have changed the words, they've changed the doctrines, and they're worshiping something different brothers and sisters. They're worshiping something different. And it's going to be shown, just like it was shown in the days of the apostles. The apostles received the early rain. They received the power of the Holy Ghost on the day of Pentecost. Let me ask you a question. Did the Sanhedrin receive the power? Did the Sanhedrin receive the power to cast out devils and heal people with their shadow? Did the Sanhedrin receive the power to raise people from the dead and and you know heal crippled people and blind? 
Did they re no, they didn't. So it went to show you they both claimed to be worshiping the same Most High, but only one group was. The other group was not. So it, it shows that it's extremely important that we know who we're worshiping and that we're worshiping the true Most High because he's not hearing people that are not obedient to him. He's not hearing them. Even if they claim to be worshiping the same God, they're not. Okay? They're just not. Because if they were, they get the same spirit. But they're not. So here, he's promising in Deuteronomy chapter 11, Take heed, he says, that your heart be not deceived, and that ye turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. That's what he said. Let's look at that. Deuteronomy, these be the words. Adabarim chapter 11, verses 16 and 17. Notice what it says. We're going to stop right here today and start at chapter uh, verse 18 next time. But he says right here, take heed to yourselves that your heart be not deceived and ye turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. Then Yahweh's wrath be kindled against you and he shut up the heaven that there be no rain and that the land yield not her fruit lest ye perish quickly from off the good land which Yahweh giveth you. See? So he's telling us, don't worship other gods. And that, what, that, what does that mean in 2016? Well, first of all, it just goes to show you there's a whole bunch of denominations out here not worshiping the true most high. Obviously, they, they all think they are, right? Obviously, they do. They all think they are. But the prophecy of Isaiah 4 is being fulfilled. We will eat our own bread and wear our own apparel only let us be called by thy name to avoid reproach. So there's a lot of people that are calling on what they think is the name of Jesus or the name of God in heaven, but they really are not worshiping the same Most High that is here in Deuteronomy 11. They're not worshiping the same Messiah that is his son. They are not. And all you need to do to go worship another God is follow some doctrine that is not supported by the Bible alone. Testing one, two, three, are you following me? If what you believe cannot be found in the scriptures, you must be worshiping another God. Because everything that we believe should be able to be substantiated by a thus saith the Lord in the Bible, period. Period. Not the Bible in some other book, the Bible. Period. If you can't find it in there, we ain't got no business messing with it. We ain't got no business messing with it. Okay, And I don't see any place in the Bible for a 501c3 corporation. I don't see any place in the Bible for a denomination. I don't see any place in the Bible for different names of religions that people got today. I don't see any of that in there. Do you? I don't see it. So brothers and sisters, he said, if you worship other gods, you're not going to receive the spirit. Period. He said it right there in black and white. So brothers and sisters, let us make sure we are being true to the plain words of the scriptures. Let us make sure that we are being repentant to the Most High and receiving justification by faith so that all our sins are forgiven. Let us make sure that we're receiving the robe that he's offering us of perfect righteousness, which he gives us as a gift. Let us be sure that we're receiving by faith the spirit that comes with that righteousness, that we might be obedient to all his commandments and his statutes and his judgments. Then we'll know we're worshiping the right most high, the right one. And we got the right one because most people do not. Most people think they're worshiping what they call God 